Ne želata ne soditi tošte Francesco Prescoit, skroje z imeli krcijo Future Art of Jean Platform, ne možete Jan Kastuljus pa prezgedo na pri Future Art of Jean Platform, na prezgedo na imamo ne želata te nekaj. Ob vsem imamo prezgedo, oš se pa je još te studijo interesante. Kam post probleme se studijo je rejme že tu, kjer se šta post, no ne kam jih ima manj detalje. Francesco, kam post sem ne ima problem in je drtim to, kjer pa me inženjera, kjer je pa res. In nače kena, pa ta fun, kjer je bilo zdobo, ne mora, da pun su inženjera, kjer ja nismo drtu vrat, no ima design in build, kot vam ne ima. Te vrnem je da pa Future Art, da še pa tudi nula, da pa kam v hop in tirja pa Future Art, da še pa tudi nula, 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 To je šel straight forward, ne skuri, kam ne to, ki nam mojt ni se tako ene materijal ne zvira v kohu, se nekaj tjeter. Če jo spegoj na proceduru, se čuš v kohu, no ne bom tako na vsa rosta, če kam če ne so vse so ne bošla preveđevali, to je več kak krko ne feja, še pa tvojno manj mlade evropjane arhitekture, ki došla na bod, pa ne zatrganizala, pa ne bila na festivali ta arhitektura, pa ni spretrenali za zvonost, muzeje, arhitekturo smo v Poleni, v Svicer, Čepani, v Italiji, v Lesa, v Nantel. Pa z žal šel nek šal v Fjolim, ki se je Francesco, Francesco Pris. Zdaj. 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 Uh, breaking special speaking with the person I've been in contact with um, and you guys. I mean, I will do the presentation anyways because uh, if, even if the room was empty because it's so beautiful that I decided I would be presenting to the walls, which I am quite mm -hmm. But it's uh, good that you're here. Um, you know, I come from a, I come from the farthest country, the most uh, remote country uh, for you guys, you can find. If you say, like, I'm going to the country in Europe that is most remote, then you would probably end up uh, in Portugal, somewhere in the area where I come from and where we, uh, where we work, you know. Uh, I give you this context because I think it's important for you to understand what's coming after. You know, uh, Portugal is a, is a country uh, made of people that uh, fled from hunger and wars and, uh, and, and, uh, and the pests. And, you know, people who didn't want to, who couldn't handle it anymore, they would start to go down uh, to, to flee to southern Europe. They would cross the Pyrenees and as they would go further south in Spain already, uh, they would find like this uh, um, um, Arab um, uh, armies and so they would go further to the Atlantic coast till a very small patch of land uh, that's uh, where they could hide behind the mountains and they were protected by this uh, river with the very steep cliffs and there they would stay. You know, people and all kinds of people just going there and hiding so they you know, could live peacefully. Um, and so that's where Portugal started. And, uh, um, and there's a saying, an old ancient saying from that time, um, saying that um, if, you, if you're looking for a, for a, for a, for a family, you, you should serve people, you should love people next to you. If you're looking for a land, you should plant a tree. And I'll tell you where it connects to the, you know, Portugal is a country with the oldest borders in Europe. Uh, borders date uh, the 11th, uh, 11th century, so it's pretty far back and they haven't changed till uh, today. Um, and perhaps, and this is my interpretation, the reason being that um, it's, a, it's a place where people can somehow protect themselves, that's number one. But it's a place that, that has a tradition with connecting to the land. I mean, you don't belong there if you don't really connect to the land, because just by connecting to the land, you're part of it. You don't own the land, but you become part of it. And this old ancient saying is 
pointing in that direction. You know, if you want to uh, be part of something, especially if you, if you want to be uh, welcomed by land, you should actually contribute. And I'm now going to show you how does it connect to architecture and how does it connect to materials. Okay, so the presentation I'm bringing to you today is about this connection between ourselves and the land and the territory uh, we, uh, we live in. Okay, so um, the first part is about the territory, the second part is about the practice, the practice and how we operate. Um, Scray started with a, it was me and a friend of mine, we uh, decided to collect the soils from Portugal. We went, we went, we, we got into the car, we put a lot of plastic bottles in there and plastic bags, and we went around Portugal for a couple of weeks just collecting soil. And uh, we quite, we didn't know exactly what we were doing, but there was a fascination with trying to understand what's, what's, what's the land we live. And so we started to, to put this clay into bottles so we could actually see how it's built up. When you put, when you put the soil into bottles, it, you can actually see how, it, how it's made, you know, with the components. And we made it with hundreds and hundreds, we have like hundreds of these uh, samples. Uh, and from sampling soil, uh, we started to work with it and to test it and to see whether we could, you know, get plasters out of it bricks, what could we do with that, you know? I think this is my phone. Um, and so we did. I mean, we were deeply involved with this material, which for us had almost kind of a spiritual uh, uh, status. And so um, we started to relate to the territory through the earth. Uh, and uh, nowadays, I'm going to show you, now we, we use it extensively. Everywhere we go, we, the first thing we do is to take soil samples and we do everything with it, from, 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 from uh, mortars for, 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 uh, for houses, so we, you know, we don't use uh, uh, cement mortars, we do it with uh, earth mortars, from renders for walls, wall finishings, and bricks, for instance. We have our own uh, brick production, uh, bricks made out of com compressed clay, complex soil, uh, compacted soil. So you compact it in a, this is a t test in the, in, in the lab, you know, we compact soil so we can make, for instance, mosaics for flooring. Uh, we make the renders, everything in this one building we, we recovered was made out of 12 earth bags. We ordered the bags and with that, we made the floors, the ceilings, the walls, bathrooms. Um, we have some experience with that. We've been making, you know, more sophisticated stuff, um, bigger, smaller. I'm not here to show you buildings. I'm here to show you like materials, territory, how to work, and you know, pictures of buildings. That's that's for another time, where we, uh, you know, where we chat somewhere. Uh, you know, we've, we've been using it extensively and, 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 and there's a connection between this material and also the economy and creating jobs and everything. I'll get to that later. Uh, we have a close relation to stones. I mean, we've been um, uh, collecting uh, samples of stones uh, in the territory where we act. It's not the whole of Portugal, but it's the north of Portugal. Um, and, and, and showing it to people and showing it to experts, to winemakers, to agricultures, to builders, you know, and everybody sort of, uh, it, it, it gives, it, there's a lot of information when you start to look at these materials and pay attention to them, to what you have under your feet, what you have on top of you, on your context, like an animal, like a, so I bring you here the, an example of a winery we made. Uh, we, did, we didn't have much money for it, so we went to the close by quarry, and we decided to, um, and we asked them, how big can you cut a stone? I mean, what's the biggest stone you can cut? They said, well, we can do it with five meters. That's how much we can assure you. So we thought, well, well let's dig a five meters wide hole and let's set the stones on top of it. 
and then you know, then we can uh, make our winery. The nice thing about it is that we could do that because we realized that uh, the slate stone, this is slate stone, it was oriented vertically, you know, like a bread, when you cut the slices of a bread. So it was very easy, it was like, it took us like less than a week, it was like four days for a machine to open this, to, you know, to, to break the stone and start to, 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 to make a, the, uh, the, this, 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 um, this hole into the ground. Um, which then gave an excellent, incredible winery uh, where we've been working uh, and making our own wine, actually, also there. Uh, but the relation with stone goes all into the techniques of, and also letting the stones visible in buildings and a lot more also. We can make plasters out of stones, you can, you can do so much. Uh, oil and waxes, I mean, oil and waxes have been part of architecture for ages. We forgot about it. If you, I mean, people have no idea when you use a varnish or when you use something for, for, uh, for. Um, um, uh, wait a second. This might be my mom. Pharmaceutical companies, they will buy them. You don't have them for you. So you might have some kind of, you know, ordinary bee wax, but all the other incredible waxes bees can fabricate, you will never see them. And they are so incredible for making paints and varnishes, and even to make steel, uh, protection for steel. So steel can be in open air and not rust. You can use uh, uh, waxes for that. Um, and so we started early on working with oils and making uh, a rammed earth floors. This is floors, earth floor, where you mix oil to it and then it becomes really hard. I mean, not these. These are part of testings, but like this one is a sample of, of, uh, of a, a, a compressed earth floor. Uh, it's a really funny story about this. Nobody could tell us, people could tell us the recipe, but they couldn't tell us how to do it. So everybody was like, yeah, 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 I know, you know, I've seen one, and this, and that, yeah, but how do you actually make it? Well, you know, and then when we started to try, you know, when you, when you ram the earth, like here, like bang, 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 you know, this is like full of earth, you start ramming here, like bing, 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 and it starts to go up over there, and then you gotta go over there, and ram it bang, and it was, it's like crazy, and we couldn't find how people, old times, they would have like complete, like huge areas of this compacted uh, soils, uh, floorings, uh, till we, uh, we were talking to a friend of ours and he was explaining how people uh, step the wine in these pools. You know, Romans used to make wine in these pools, they would carve a, a pool in the granite and they would go like jam, 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 and the pools would cut quite big. And this friend was explaining that uh, it had to be made by many people at a time, with their hands uh, to each other, you know, standing like this, they would sing so they could step all at the same time. And by stepping at the same time, they would get a much better result into compacting, I mean, basically smashing the grapes. And then, you know, we found out how they used to do old times uh, compacted earth, earth floors were made by people holding hands and stepping on it all at the same time. So, you know, there are some interesting moments when you research on materials. Like this is a material that is, is you, you wax it with a olive oil soap to make it hard. It has to do with the carbonatation of lime. Lime carbonates, carbonates faster, so it, it hardens faster when you use a, the black olive oil soap. Um, you can research on this tablet. It's a, 
It's a technique the Romans developed when they got to the north of Africa. And for instance, this, this one house is the one I told you we made, we recovered with these 12 earth bags, but we couldn't do it if we had no oil, because oil is used to harden the earth. So, you know, the, the flooring and the walls up to that mid-level, it's, uh, it's oiled, so it gets really hard. And then the top part, we just leave it, uh, um, we just leave it fragile, uh, so that it can breathe, so it can take the, whole, the the moist from the air, and it gives a very, very nice uh, environment to the indoor environment. It's the same story. It's using oils to harden the the plasters. Here, basically, um, well, we also use um, waxes to make this kind of um, how do you call it? glass, where light goes through. It works really well. And wood, I mean. We started, Portugal, we're running out of wood. If you haven't run out of wood, you're gonna run out of wood soon. I mean, wood is, uh, uh, there's a kind of a, it's, it's a drama, really. I mean, all these wildfires, it's not wildfires, criminal fires that all over Europe, I mean, in, in, uh, in Sweden and, and Greece and Portugal, you know, and, and the soil is getting drier and drier and drier and trees don't go, grow that fast and we really running out of trees. So we don't have wood in Portugal. All the wood we import, the wood we have is like, it's like pedophilia, you know, it's like small, early, like fast grown trees, they don't even mature and they like chop to make wood. It's crazy, crazy. So what we start to do, we start to, to, um, to have our own trees. So we go to people, that don't value the trees they have, you know, they're like, oh, one day I'll kill, I'll, hire, I'll you know, sell those trees or just, uh, and we say, no, 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 just leave, leave them there, we're going to take care of them. And then we, we, we know the trees we have and we use them for, for, for building, um, for making floorings and, and then we replace them. We, we replace the trees, there's this uh, uh, tree nursery, so we ask our clients, to pay for the replacement of the wood they use, okay? So um, uh, that's that's if they want to work with us, they will have to pay for that. And so we go to this uh, tree nursery, and they're going to plant them, and then they're going to take these trees to a to a to a natural reserve or to the city because it's actually the city nursery, so they also use it for the city. Um, and so you know this relation with wood. From the beginning, with trees, it gives you such a, it's such a pleasure to be an architect when you have this. The strange thing is that we sort of lost all of that. You know, we've completely stuck in front of computer screens. And this is the most amazing profession in terms of materiality. It's, it's, it's so incredible. Like, we have this wood so we can, also carpenters love to, to make the process from beginning to end. You know, from cutting the tree, letting it dry, okay, and then all the way to the to the making of the building. We also reuse a lot of wood. I mean, this door, this is made from wood recycled from wine barrels. This is mm, this ceiling is also oh, sorry, it's made from also wood from wine barrels. So we recycle this um, uh, barrels from wood also. And when we get into a building, we save all the wood we can, from doors to windows, and then we recycle them into the ceilings, for instance. These ceilings made with the, with the doors. Huh? Um, also, furniture, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wine tasting table. You see, well, we <laughs> everything has to do with wine in one or another way, anyways. Uh, fibers and plants, you know, how much CO2 do you put into the atmosphere when you use concrete, for instance? And let's take, we could take steel, concrete, and anyway. how much? Okay. One ton of concrete, you know what one ton, one ton of concrete is? You probably do. It's like a block like, like this, okay? Because you know, we were engineering students, architecture students, you know, uh, how concrete works. For one ton of concrete, you get one ton of CO2 into the atmosphere and it has nothing to do with energy use. It's a chemical reaction that has to happen 
when you burn the limestone and there's one ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. What's one ton of CO2? You know, if you have one cubic meter of air has two grams of uh, CO2. Which means that if you wanna if you wanna think of what one ton of CO2 is, you better start to think of a couple of soccer stadiums, you know, like wrapped in a plastic bag, and then you might get uh, uh, into the dimension of of CO2 emissions related to concrete. So this kind of same understanding you have to oh that's Well, oh, nice. Thanks. So, I mean, this kind of relationships we need to have. When you write down, this building will be made with concrete. Man, you should know what you're doing. I mean, use concrete, but be very, um, be very uh, responsible on the choices you make. The same way if you say, oh, it's going to be made with that very dark and hard wood which I saw. I mean, what's a dark and hard wood? That's a tropical wood. Come on, where is it coming from? What are you doing? So, for this kind of reasoning, we start to think of uh, an amazing fiber. Portugal has been for, uh, for a couple of centuries a major exporter of hemp. Hemp is used for making, for making ropes. For, for boats, it's used for clothing, it's used, it's used for oils, it's, uh, it has a number of applications. But for one or another reason, that doesn't have much to do with, uh, with smoking, it has a lot more to do with the patents from pharmaceutical companies and, and the connection. And for instance, Ford, when he made the first car, it was meant to run with hemp fuel. Huh? And the whole car was made with hemp, hemp plastic. I mean, that was a very serious thing. So that's where the story starts. But anyways, construction. This is amazing material for construction. I mean, really amazing. You can't imagine. I've never seen something like this by far. And I, I can tell, you know, we've been researching on materials for a while. Uh, we made our own machine to press com uh, hemp bricks. So these bricks are made with uh, clay and hemp. And, um, this might seem a little funny to you guys because it's made of hemp, but you sh should just keep in mind that uh, uh, two things. For once, this is the only building material that will comply with the regulation, thermal regulation, acoustic regulation, and fire regulation at the same time. There's no other material in the market which you can make a massive wall out of it and you comply with all regulations at once. Okay? So this material has this potential. Number two is an amazing plant, and we're talking about industrial hemp, it's an amazing plant to restructure the soil. So countries like mine, where we in a full process of desertification, this plant could actually help to revert it. Okay? So when you make a building of 100 square meters of hemp, you're actually using 3 hectares of this one plant. So uh, one small house and 3 hectares of hemp plantation that is restructuring the soil, that's the relation. Um, natural pigments, I mean, we've been working a lot with natural pigments. We use pigments not to color alone, but also to protect wood and hemp from insects and funguses. So, you know, uh, indigo is an amazing uh, pigment. Um, henna is in amazing. I mean, we've been we're now developing this and we're close to, to get to a point where we can make hemp resistant to funguses, which is a very, it's a breakthrough because then you can use hemp in the outside walls without getting them damaged by water. Okay? The same story with wood. And the wood, is, the problem is not water, it's funguses it's, uh, that, that, that grow when there's water in it, but the fungus is actually killing the wood. So. Um, Basically, hemp has the same problem. Um, we've been using uh, the leftovers of wine industry to make uh, plasters and to make bricks. This is like a wall made with a wine plaster, if you want to call it. Uh, Non-vascular plants, that's the research we, we, it's going on now. If You know this, um, I don't know how to call this, it's, some, it's this small plant that grows in walls and it's kind of fluffy. <laughs> it's, you know, it's this nice, um, 
It's very interesting to make to bring shadow to buildings, so the walls don't get the sun striking directly onto the walls. Uh, and because they're non-vascular, they don't have roots, they don't damage the walls. So there's a huge potential in using these plants to reduce the the, the thermal um, uh, to make uh, the, the thermal performance of buildings better. Um, and you know the. I think the main challenge of the future has to do with dust and shadow. I mean, dust and shadow are, are going to be critical issues in the future. Um, bacteria. I mean, the, see these shelves, all these boxes, what's in it is something like this. And this is like a, a colony of bacteria, uh, which are, if, if you make them here, you'll get something else, okay? If you make it in Porto, where I come from, you get something close to this, but if you go next door, you get something else. So it's something very specific to your uh, condition, your territory. And what you can do with this is basically to transform it into some kind of letter. And this letter is a... a we think we can use it to start to replace asphaltic... Uh, um, uh, how do you call the uh, this asphaltic um, uh, sheets you use for for making buildings waterproof? You know, in roofs you see them uh, very often. Okay, um, and this is what you this is this is it. I mean, it's, this is a part of it. This is how it looks like. It's uh, translucent, and uh, and there's a, a potential to to make them uh, waterproof uh, buildings. You know, animal manure, everybody knows about this, everybody heard about it. You can use um, uh, horse dung or cow dung, you know, basically the shit of the animal. <laughs> Don't use your own, you're going to get some nasty results. Um, for, for building. And it's, again, it's like, uh, it's a material that has been used for ages and we totally forgot about it. And we know very little what you can do with that. And it can provide you, it can provide you with amazing uh, structure into the, into, the, into the plasters and bricks because when the animal eats, he makes kind of nanofibers. And this structure of nanofibers, which, is, uh, which are actually very, 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 very small, I mean, it's something which would cost a lot to make with machines, uh, you can use to reinforce bricks. And uh, we've been doing that especially in restaurants like this one. You know, the walls and the bathrooms are made with it. We also use a sheet pool for, uh, for, uh, for thermal insulation. Uh, we get them from leftovers from the, from the wool industry, you know, when they make um, yeah, you know, stuff like this. <laughs> you get a lot of leftovers and you can get them for free and uh, insulate your buildings. Um, Mycelium. Uh, that's another jump. I mean, actually, when you talk of bacteria, that's bacteria that make the horse dung. Okay, what happens here is done mostly by bacteria. Uh, this is another story. This is a story of uh, of, uh, of mushrooms, mycelium, where you can make bricks out of it. Or uh, actually, the most potential of it is not in making bricks, but making thermal insulation for buildings where you have. Uh, you can grow this in, be in wall cavities, you know, you have a wall and a wall and in between usually you put some styrofoam or something, you can actually have this to grow inside your wall and make a very efficient uh, uh, thermal insulation. Well, I'm going to show you a little bit of how we work, okay. Uh, the first part is the result of all of this, all of this coming together, it brings you kind of a language, a way of that it not an author of anything, you're basically putting things together and that's how they look like when you work with waxes, when you work with, uh, with the ship wool, when you work with, uh, with earth, you start to get this kind of interesting language uh, discourse between materials. But this you have to bring into construction, okay? So we, we're, we're a construction company, okay? We do architecture, we have uh, number of engineers working uh, with us. We have an arts residency, you know, so it's this big, big mix. But formally, in the paper, we're a building company. 
And when, when you have to build, you have to anticipate, there's something that is very scary, which is the logistics. You know, how do things get in there? How do you get them out of there? You know, all of logistics is really a big issue. And also, when you work with materials that are not tested, which you yourself, you've been testing them in laboratories, but they haven't been certified. I mean, you also want them to perform uh, perfectly, no? So, we found a way to handle that. I mean, we found two ways, but I'm going to tell you one way. The other one, I tell you later. Okay, I tell you two ways. Uh, well, the first way is this. If you're a construction company, you're the one that rules. Okay, so if the building surveyor goes to you and say, hey, where's the certification for this, and uh, it's not going to work, you say, hey, I give the guarantee for the building, for 10 years, the law says the builder is responsible for everything that has to do with construction, so you shut up. Huh? And then, or if, the, if, the, if, if someone tells the client, oh, don't do that, it's not going to work, I say, yeah, but the guarantee is on me. I'm here to fix it if it doesn't work. So this is, this is why I decided to tell you this, because if you're an architect and if you want to work with innovative or non-certified materials, stuff you do yourself, okay, from paints to plasters, bricks, whatever, I mean, try, you better also become a builder. And that's a very nice bypass. And you can make money with that. You know, when you build something, you make a lot of money. When you make architecture projects, okay, if you do them nicely and you don't get into crazy schemes, you don't make that much money. So, uh, if you want to be a... If you, and I think architects are ready to be incredible professionals that can actually do the whole chain of the building construction from materials development, you know, to projects, into building construction. I mean, let's use that. Let's do that. The second thing, the second trick uh, we use is that we make these big models. For instance, we wanted to make an arch with the bricks we produce. So we made a number of models, scale models, where we build them. We make the bricks, small bricks, tiny bricks. We build these models. Then we take them to the workshop. We make an arch. We demolish it a couple of times to see how it works. Because we need to see, nobody ever saw it, or nobody can tell us anything. So you actually have to test it yourself. So don't underestimate your capacity to test stuff. You don't need labs or, in, or formulas or anything. Just do the thing and test it. If you want to see if a brick is strong enough, just put in two bricks, make this one to make a bridge and step on it. And you'll get a feeling of how much it can stand or make make prototypes. And so this is uh, me and my partner making this, uh, this arch. Also making big models help people, you know, people who build. This is a one, two, five model or something of this wall. Um, uh, this is a clay wall. And it really helps the builders, people that are on site. They see the model and they say, ha, ah, okay, I know what to do. I mean, don't show me anything. I know. And they can help you. Uh, these are models we use for. Um, this is the this is the sun and the moon path. Okay, so this 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 is a hotel in the middle of nowhere in, in, in the south of Portugal, and we wanted to see how the sun turns and how the moon turns. It has nothing to do with what a computer software can give to you. Okay, this is this is uh, way more um, way more informing, or it's informing in another sense, but it's way more interesting for us to do it this way than just use a computer software. You know, because in this way you can you can you can move stuff. Every and you can have a team of ten people to do it at the same time. And everybody understands what's going on. And you're working with technicians that they, they, they used to look at tiny small details and then you try to explain them the concept, you know, they don't get it. So you better show them a model and they will like, oh okay I see that's the building, okay that's the sun arch, oh cool. You know, so models are this kind of congregating objects where people really sort of 
feel um, um, they, they, can, they can participate. So this is a model where we also map the geology. So you see different patches, and the patches are made with the earth we take from that area. So the geology, you know, the, the, uh, there were different kinds of clay in that area. So we also put in a model and uh, modulate, uh, modulate the, uh, the uh, hotel accordingly. Well, um, we're just showing you some. So these are not really models, they are small constructions. It's tiny, small constructions, but these are buildings. And it's not a model to represent something. This is like a, a working tool, okay? It's our office. Some more models. Yeah, this one with the straw bill. It's a grab system. It's really, really nice. To, it's difficult for carpenter to understand what this system means. Basically, uh, when you have a wood, a wood structure, you have this pillar, this wood column. If you break it in two, two columns of the same size, and you and you and you set them apart, the structure uh, triples, quadruples its uh, performance structurally. So you get this super strong structure where you can put the straw bales, the straw in between. You see here. And it's 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 recent stuff. I mean, it's from the from uh, from Toronto. Uh, it's Canadian research from 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 the from from 20 years ago. Well, we use models to cast light into build, buildings. You see, ding, 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 ding. see how you cast the light, and you can get a sense of of how the building will be uh, lit. Um, and also, of course, models are useful to talk to your clients. Um, so, like this one or like this, you know. Um, but a very interesting part of this is when you start to make your own tools. Tools to work with materials. So you want to make hemp grit, these blocks of hemp, you need a tool for making that. Um, this is, for instance, a tool to press the mosaics I showed to you, these earth, earth uh, mosaics. This is, the, this is the hempcrete machine when it was not working. You see what's happening there? Everybody is, <laughs> is hanging in the machine. You can see that guy? He's, look at his feet. It's not in the ground. I mean, everybody's hanging there trying to press as much as possible. It was not working. Uh, we finally got it to work, but uh, it's part of the process. We fail like 10 times before we make one step ahead. This is uh, the machine, another press uh, machine. This is like a machine we made to cut stone into some, some awkward curves. So, you know, when you cut stone, you, there's no blade that goes like this, so you can't you can make a kind of a... It's very hard to make these uh, uh, complex shapes into hard granite stone. Except for Egyptians, who managed to do that, but nobody can explain that. I mean, literally, some people in the pre-dynastic Egypt did this, and nobody has a clue how they did it. But except for that, <laughs> we made this, this machine, where he had the, the wire for cutting stone is, is, is standing in the same place and the stone is turning. So we turn the stone, you know, and, it, and the wire starts to cut it in different, in different shapes. I mean, we also made this machine to make uh, holes into stone, into very hard stone. This is the, wow, this is the hemp machine in the later development stage. This is a biogas machine. I mean, the making of machines is not about innovating. I mean, let's make a new machine. No, it's about you understanding materials. You know, how much do you need to press a hemp block? We thought you needed 200 kilos. No, you need 600. What's 600 times three? Because we're making three blocks at a time. Okay, that's 1800 kilos. What's 1800 kilos? What's that length? So it's basically what we did. We thought we needed 200 kilos, so we have a, a leverage, you know, leverage, I think. Okay. It was like 
this big. We, we thought we could do it, but then it, 200 is not enough, 300, 400, and the leverage starts to grow bigger. So at this moment, our leverage is like this big, and you have to go like all the way down to, to get it to press 1800 uh, kilos into. But uh, you see, that's, that's what the guy was doing. He was trying to press this leverage. Uh, but then you can also work your own perception. Don't think that you, that you shape materials, okay? You're constantly being shaped yourself. Your brain is like this infinite, uh, infinite uh, jungle of muscles, you know? Each one has a specific task and these are changing constantly. You rewire them all the time, all the time. And that has a lot to do with architecture. We, if you think your brain or your brain is a muscle, okay? So uh, muscle. So you you can educate it, and you can educate it to think about spaces. Where's the little one that is responsible for for conceiving spaces? Where's that one? Which area of the brain is that? Where is it? You don't actually have to know, but you can actually make tools to exercise it, like a gymnasium. Huh? Gymnasium to exercise your spatial imagination, all right? So these kind of tools we've been making, I'm not going to show you a lot of that, um, and also exercises on that, but um, there's, there's a lot to be researched and thought about it. Um, also tools for society, that's maybe the most important tools you can have. You know, Joseph Beuys, there was this German artist, kind of Andy Warhol from Germany, and the guy, he was saying that uh, an artist is someone who shapes society. You don't need to have an artwork in a museum. I mean, society itself is something that is ready to be shaped. And uh, you as an artist or, or as, 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 as a citizen, you uh, uh, have to be aware that you're shaping society and people around you all the time. So for that reason, we made the movie we were showing to you. We were casting this movie to show some people the identity of a certain area they came from. It was the movie that was just screening. Or we made some installations. This one installation, there was an a, a, a art gallery. They asked us for a bathroom. They, they need to have a bathroom in their, uh, in their gallery. And we said, well, we need a whole room. Why do you need a whole room? Yes, we need a whole room. We can't make a bathroom if we don't have a whole room. And so what we did, we did a dry toilet. So that thing over there, the black one, is the toilet. That is a dry toilet, a composting toilet. And when you, when you use just research on dry toilets and composting toilets, you, you can get energy out of it. You get heat, you get gas. And so from, from, and you get compost, which is really good for plants and for, for the land. And so from that thing, we took gas to the uh, oven that is over there, and we got a, a water pipe going to this one bucket. And then this orange tree, which was almost dead actually, she, she was supposed to get the compost. Um, but I had to return it, so I don't know, she never got a compost. So this was to show like, um, a toilet is not a toilet, it's the beginning of, 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 uh, of plant life of soil. We do a lot of workshops. Um, we're very happy to work with that. We think like young like students are perhaps the ones who understand the work we do. You know, if you talk to to elderly about these things, I mean they completely say like, yeah, get away from you, you know, it's, it's like what are you doing? You're not an architect then, you know. But we kind of have a special empathy with students because Somehow, I don't know if due to intuition or just or just that the times are changing, that they can see that this has to do with building and the territory and the landscape and architecture. You know, from from decades, it was not supposed to be about that. It was only about stacking buildings and making really cool stuff. You know, like, and so we make. We also have a department, not a department. We have some. People who we organize uh, climate marches and and, uh, and uh, civil actions in the city. Um, 
which was really fine because we started doing this and now we have a couple of organizations that are also doing it. And for a construction company, it's very nice to do this because you get rid of a lot of rubbish you have in your warehouse, you, you know, because people, <laughs> all these sticks and all these uh, uh, cloths, they paint the rest, leftovers of paints and everything, they use it to write the messages, like, yeah, cool, let's make the... And so you also, well, it's a joke, of course, that's not a reason for it, but, uh, um, but it's also... Uh, a way of putting it. Well, the, this this was the last workshop I did like two weeks ago in uh, in Graz, where we made this machine. I mean, this is not finished uh, here. This is basically a machine to print the asphalt, because people they were saying like, yeah, yeah uh, we need to renew the neighborhoods. You know, people don't have uh, playgrounds for children. They and some other says, yeah, we don't have parking lots, and and so, you know, as an architect or an urbanist. What's the use of going there and say, okay, here's a playground, there we go, I'm an architect. No, it doesn't work like that. Because there are no tools, no real tools for these people to talk to the authorities, to the people who make the city, the municipal authorities. They don't give a shit, you know, that, that, you, know, that you shout that you want a playground. You know, so you need to have the tools to really press these people to make what you think should be done. And that's urbanism. It's community building. That's the root of urbanism. It's not about making rules and policies. That's another story. It comes after. But at the very beginning, urbanism is about connecting people into what they think should be done to the land they live in. And so we made this uh, barrel, which is basically a machine to print the messages in the asphalt. So you, it's, 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 uh, there's the pump. <laughs> The guy has the yellow pump in his back, is with paint. You pump the paint into the barrel, and then as the barrel uh, rolls uh, in the street, you get a message printed. Uh, and that message could be, give us a playground for our children. Because there's no other way these people are going to get a playground if they have to fill a form or make a, you know, this is, a, this is urbanism for me. Um, well, this is our website for the Climate Action Group. This is Leonor. She was heading the arts, arts residency. So we get artists to, 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 to work with us and to develop their work there. And that's, we can learn so much from, from, this, uh, from these kids who, you know, they, they, they come with completely new ideas. They, we help them to develop them, they help us to develop our own. And one of the works that uh, the, the, the last thing we did was this one. This is basically a, an action we did in Porto. So, so this is an area in, in Porto. And it's a performance about the last beekeeper. Because bees, as you know, they're disappearing. Some people say they know why, others say nobody knows why. But the fact is, when you, and I have my bees, I mean not I, but my company, we do have our own bees, and they actually, all of a sudden, they die. They disappear. They get, so, it's a fact. So this was an action about the last beekeeper. It was like this fiction story about the last beekeeper who wanted to be buried uh, next to his beehive. So at the head, what you see is an ancient form of a beehive. They used to make it with the rope going like this. These were like the ancient beehives. Um, also from this area, actually, all the way to Turkey. That's you have crazy beehives, huh? You know that? You know that? No, I should check it. Have really, there's a people in, in uh, make beehives into the rocks, and they carve the rock, and then they, they they put a kind of a lid, and the bees just take the hole and, and, and make their colony there. It's really beautiful and it's not something you find in other places. But anyways, this action about the last beekeeper is actually the last slide I have to show to you. Um, I don't know how long this lecture lasted, but I think 45, 49 minutes. I see it here. So, I wasn't time. <laughs> Thanks, Becky.